Truth comes out. Yeah. 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 The birthday song, it is very long. Hey! Any other dark secrets we need to reveal this morning? <laughs> All right. Hey, well, you, well, <laughs> that may be a good preamble in this morning because there's a, you may have heard there's a difference between ministry and meddling, and I'm going to do my best not to be meddling this morning, but uh, I hope we I hope we do uh, push some buttons this morning. We need a preamble as well. We're going to be in John 9 starting at verse 26, but as we step into that, um, uh, I want to try to give us kind of a characteriz- characterizing preamble. If you come to my house, we have a freestanding garage, and, and between the cars in the garage, there's a set of stairs that goes up to my shop, and, and on those stairs, on a weekly basis, you're going to find a, a, a slowly growing stack of empty Perrier bottles and, and, and empty Coke, uh, Diet Coke cans, uh, bags that once contained nuts, and uh, uh, ba- oh, bags that once contained wisp low carbohydrate cheese crackers and and so if, if, if and i and i i know this because i clean this stuff out on a regular basis and and it, it, that's on my wife's side of the stair that leads up to my shop in the garage and so uh, if you were to go in there and see that you could easily deduce some things about somebody who lives there and you would you would say that this is a person who's trying to kind of limit her sugar intake uh that is uh um likes carbonation, uh, is looking for low carbohydrates and high proteins, and at least some of somebody's dietary habits here would be revealed by what you found there. And uh, if, uh, if you're kind of an old school guy, uh, you would know that that's a tool that a lot of investigative detectives use is you just dig through people's trash. You dig through people's trash and you find out a whole lot about them and by what they throw away. Uh, this, uh, you can find out uh, uh, male or female in the household. You can find out what their dietary habits are. If they're careless with their, their male, you'll find out a whole lot about them through the mail that they throw out. Um, and in that process, it's kind of gotten into a new generation now, your digital footprint. If you look into some people's digital footprints, you'll find out huge amounts of material about them. And the, the, what you find out about them is really not what I'm focused on, is, is what you're revealing about yourself that you really don't know that you're revealing. Uh, Gail is a hawk for this about, uh, about sensitive information that can be used against you that, or, or you can be taken advantage of by, that by making it in our trash, uh, into our trash cans. But you can, you can, you, what happens is, is that you reveal a huge amount about yourself that you don't know and quite, or that, uh, that you don't know you're relate, revealing. And if brought back to you, it may let you know a little bit about you that you didn't necessarily think or know or realize about yourself. Now this is, this is, this is, uh, 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 an easy kind of process to follow, easy one to understand. I uh, was at a social engagement several years ago, and I knew that this was going to be a kind of an uncomfortable social engagement. So, so my 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 uncomfortable meter was already set up on ten. Uh, and this this woman walked up to me. She was an older woman, and she had a very very sour disposition. And she says, "I looked you up on the internet. I wanted to find out just who you are." And so I was in a kind of a randy mood, and 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 and, and since I was pegging on ten on the uncomfortable meter already, uh, I just told her, I said, "Well, I apologize ahead of time for such a great disappointment." And then she sniffed at me and and, and walked away. And so what she was looking at was was the the most disappointing, I'm sure, carbon footprint she, or or a, a social media footprint she'd ever seen in her life. Um, what you can learn about people and what can be revealed about you is often done in a way that you really don't much pay attention to. And what, what you're revealing about yourself and what others can glean about you has a lot to do with your appetites in life. And when I talk about your appetites, I'm not only talking about the low-carb cheese cracker bags on the stairs, I'm talking about all of the appetites that you have cultivated in your lives, that I've cultivated in my life. And so I want you to know, if you don't think about it very often, is that there's a bargaining system going on in your life all the time. It's what I'm willing to trade in order 
to indulge in my appetites. And just to, to kind of help us dig in this, and this again, this is not confession time. I don't want anybody in here to reveal any deep, dark secrets. There's enough of those of, of my own here. But I'll tell you what you trade. Some of these may be more significant than others. Some of these may not. Uh, he, 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 there's a, I just had a conversation with Greg, I think it was last Sunday. There's something really, really satisfying about an ice cold glass of milk and a tall stack of Oreo cookies. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You tell me, is that, yeah, Greg and I, yeah, Greg's licking his lips already here. Yeah, we all have appetites. But here's some of the things that you will trade to feed your appetites. You'll trade, and, and I just made a, a, just a little list while I'm driving one day. Uh, you'll trade your time. You'll trade. While you're driving? While you're driving? That's when I do most of my thinking. <laughs> and, and then if I, if I think of something that I really have to write down, I just hit the recorder on my phone and I just record it and then I, I write it down later. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Marshall's really freaked out this. <laughs> the time's right, driving down the road right now. No, I made a little list here. You'll trade your time, you'll trade your money, you'll trade your attention, your passions, your labor. The one big one for me, you'll trade your thought life. The time that you would spend thinking about the things that you really want to think about for the types of things that you're thinking about, those that are distractions in your life. You'll trade your integrity. There's lots of things that you will trade to feed your appetites. And so what are you going to give up those things? What are you going to, in the, in the kind of the, the bargain of life, what are you going to sell those things for? Your time, your resources, your passions, your, you know, what are you going to sell them for? You're going to sell them for love. You're going to sell them for comfort, for food and drink, for friendships, expanded estate, wealth, privilege, intimacy, pleasure, surprise. There's lots of things that are passions or appetites in your life that have nothing to do with food, but they're appetites that you have cultivated that have become distractions in your life, that you are willing to sell very precious things like your time to feed. Some appetites are very good. Some app most of our appetites are very distracting. So what I want you to be thinking about this morning as we get started is, what are the appetites in my life and what am I willing to sell to feed them? What am I willing to give up to feed the appetites that I have cultivated in my life? And I want you to be thinking about, well, what are the, the good appetites in my life and what are the more distracting appetites in my life? What have I cultivated a, fl a taste for, a flavor for that is really not good for my life? And I can assure you, you are filled with them. And if I rummage through the trash cans of your lives, I'll find out about them. Again, not meddling. None of us are meddling in each other's lives here. This is for you to think about, and you to think about more thoroughly than maybe you commonly do. In the trash can of my life, you would find lots of stuff that you wouldn't like me very much if you knew about me. And I'm sure there's, you've got them in yours as well. That's where Jesus is at this morning when he's talking to the people that have crossed the the, the, lake, uh, the, the Sea of Galilee and have followed him as he's going to open up the trash cans of their life and tell them a little bit about themselves that they didn't really necessarily know they don't necessarily like and they're going to feel a bit affronted by like a sour dispositioned lady who says that she's digging into my trash can on the internet which is totally disappointing you, I'll let you know ahead of time you'll be disappointed if you do that so let's get into where we're at we're just going to start in verse 26 of John 6. And it begins with, Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, you're looking for me, not because you saw miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. He's already in their trash can. He's already telling them something about themselves that they don't necessarily know, that they're not necessarily aware of. And quite frankly, it, it doesn't take much to realize that they're offended by. You're deceived yourself. There's a reason why you think you're following me, but I'm telling you that's not why. The reason you are following me, Keith, is because you had bread that I gave you and you had your fill. Bottom line is, you follow me because you think I give you a free lunch. That's it. That's the truth that I found in your trash can. 
You want to make it sound pious. You want to make it look great that, ooh, new guru in town. Let's follow the new guru. You want to make yourself feel good that you're, you think you're doing the right kind of religious thing by following me around. But I can assure you the only reason you trekked all the way across or all the way around the Sea of Galilee to meet me here is because you want lunch. That's it. And if I can insert a word in Jesus' mouth for a moment, that is absolutely pathetic. That's it? That's the only reason that you would come to me is for lunch? So let's go backwards for a minute and, and reveal a little bit what's in the trash can of these people. It's getting to be about Passover time. It's not Passover yet, but it's getting to be about Passover time. It's near. That's what we're told is, is Passover's near. And Jesus is on one side of the Sea of Galilee, and about 5,000 people show up to see him. And so he asked the disciples, uh, where are we going to get enough food to feed these guys? And, and who was it? It was uh, Philip. Philip says, gosh, you know, eight months' wages wouldn't pay for this. Well, we're kind of into that who's asking the right question and who's giving the wrong answer thing again. Jesus didn't say how much it's going to feed to feed 5,000. He says, where are we going to get the food from? Where's an operative word here? He didn't come up with an answer of where the food's coming from. He's coming up with this kind of uh, 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 qualification as to how much it's going to cost to feed them. So he's not listening to Jesus. We're going to find out that, that a lot of people aren't listening to Jesus here when Jesus is talking. It will behoove us to listen very, very carefully. A cursory reading of Scripture is a very dangerous thing to do. You end up coming up with, with a little bit of knowledge, but no wisdom. You come up with an association with Christ, but not an immersion into Christ, and, <clears throat> and Christ's immersion into you. If you're going to give God time, trading time to feed passions, if you're going to give God time to approach him in his word, give him an immersion with his word. A cursory reading is dangerous. So what happens? Jesus sidesteps that, and, and one of the other uh, disciples come. He doesn't sidestep it. Jesus doesn't address him directly. Another one of the disciples comes up and says, we have so, you know, a few loaves of bread and a few fishes. And Jesus says, that's enough. And so he takes the food, he divides it between 12 baskets, and he sends the guys out, and everybody eats, and then they collect up the, it has their fill, and that's the fill that Jesus is talking about, and why you came all the way across the lake of Capernaum, because you ate the bread and had your fill. That's the fill he's talking about. They had their fill, and then they collected up the, uh, uh, the leftovers, so there was nothing wasted, and the baskets are full, and so we're done feeding 5,000. Now, if you're a, question, a student like me, and you're asking questions, you're going to say, uh, five lo loaves went out, at least five loaves came back, but everybody had their fill. Whose question are we answering? How much it cost to feed these people? Or where did the food come from that fed these people? Because what we put in the baskets, we got back. So something happened between the time we filled those baskets and the time we collected up all the leftovers that fed 5,000 people their fill. So we're not asking how much it cost to feed these people, uh, Philip. We're asking where did it come from, which is what Jesus said to begin with. Where does this come from? Now that's an operative position, uh, it's an operative question to ask. It's an operative piece of information to understand because of where we're heading. So for us, we're sitting in a, in, in a, 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 a kind of a comfortable environment of of. of, of of, of, of Christian family here, and so it's not a really hard question to answer. Well, God provided. Now, if we get all the way over to uh, uh, Jesus, when, once he launches into his explanatory discourse, the people that have followed him around the lake or across the lake to um, Galilee saying that, Oh yeah, we got our history lesson down. We know that when our forefathers were trekking through the desert on, uh, on, in, in Exodus, um, uh, Moses fed a manna, and Jesus corrects him. No, 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 it's not Moses fed him. Moses fed him. No, don't be so ridiculous. It was God, my father, fed them. So you get the link between what they're thinking, what's in their trash cans, that Jesus is pulling out and showing them, this is what I found in your trash can, what, you, what they're thinking, and what actually just took place. But there's more in the bridge between these two events. You know, so when Jesus, uh, uh, if you ask the question, where did this food come from? Not necessarily what this, how much this food cost, but where did it come from? Uh, the only answer is, it is God who provided. So Jesus is equating God's provision 
with himself as the provider of those of that provision and then what's their response their response is 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 I, it's it's troubling to me. It's it, when if if I'm if I'm looking for cynical humor in, in scripture, I'm I'm getting a little giggly here. After the people saw that the I'm, I'm at verse 14 in uh, in chapter six. After the people saw the miraculous sign that Jesus did, they began to say, "Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world." Jesus, knowing what they intended to come to make him king by force, he withdrew himself to a mountain by himself. Oh, the the guy who feeds us must be the king that we're looking for. The guy who feeds our appetites must be the answer to the Messiah. Do you, do you get the equation that they're making? I want to make you king because you put food on my table. That's as close as they get. Now, um, I, I, I want to make a, a, a link here for a second that, 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 that may help us. If, if, if any of us have, uh, have, have listened to or read or researched anything about Christian financial ministries, there's a lot of material out there, but they'll all have this one thing in, the co in common. They'll all say that the Bible to talk about other things, but rarely ever is the Bible ever talking about money. It will use money as an, an analogously to teach you about something that you don't know by using something you do know. You know what jingles in your pockets. You don't know that you just suck it all up and you put it in pockets with holes in it and wonder why you're so poverty stricken all the time. But the Bible will use money to talk about spiritual issues all the time. Rarely ever will the Bible talk about money itself. The Bible will also use food. You will see in there the food to talk about the appetites of your life. Not to talk about how savory smoked salmon is, but to, to make that connection between the appetites in your life of food that, that will serve food for the soul and food for the spirit. And this is where I want to back up before we go on very far. If You, you know, uh, uh, Deuteronomy 8, that helps us get this in, 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 uh, in perspective really well. Moses and, and, and the Israelites are, are heading through the, uh, the, um, uh, through the desert in the Exodus, and we're at Deuteronomy now, so we're a little bit uh, uh, into a more stable environment, so Moses is looking back. And he says, remember how, um, uh, this is eight cha uh, chapter 8, verse 2, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way through the desert these 40 years. This is the end of the 40-year um, um, uh, trek through the desert. Uh, these 40 years to humble you, to test you in order to know. Not for him to know, but for you to know. God's never testing you so God can find out. He's testing you so you will know something about you that you don't know. So to test you in order to know what was in your heart. So you will know what's in your heart so that you would keep his commands. He humbled you by causing you to hunger and then fed you with manna, which neither you nor your fathers had known, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. The clear definition there is I'm going to use food to teach you a fundamental, a critically important facet of your life. You have a temporary life in this flesh that requires food, smoked salmon, to stay alive. But you have an eternal life that also must be nourished. And that nourishment for your eternal soul is every word breathed from the mouth of God. That bread of eternal life is every word breathed from the mouth of God, the word of God. That, sh that is what will nourish you, sustain you, prepare you for eternal life. And just so we're clear, you're going to live eternally. The question is not whether or not you're going to live eternally, it's what your state of eternity is going to be. What we're speaking about is eternity with him in heaven. Without that bread of life, it's an eternity in hell apart from him. So what he is talking about is live eternally in the estate of heaven with him. How, how, what's your nourishment for that life? Every word breathed from the mouth of God. That's straight from Moses, straight from God, saying, this is why I caused you to hunger. I brought you the pain of hunger in the body because you understand that one really well. What you don't understand is there's a hunger in the soul, and you're not feeding that hunger because you don't recognize that hunger because you've not developed an appetite for things eternal. And you must understand that to live eternally with God, you must develop an appetite for the things that are eternal. When I get in your trash can, I'm hoping to find things that reflect that you have cultivated an appetite for eternity. And we don't of our own accord. And even when we've been exposed to it, fed 
miraculously on the edge of the Sea of Galilee, we still don't get it, most of us. Most of us say, good enough. The guy who fills my belly is good enough to be my king. And as long as he fills my belly, he's my king. And the problem with that is, is that, that if he doesn't feed my belly, well, the next guy that feeds my belly comes along. It's good. Stalin knew this principle really, really well. It is at the core of the communist government that he established in Russia and his control over people. If you understand what their passions are and if you feed their passions, you can control them unilaterally. They'll do anything you want them to do. You can have dictatorial command over their lives as long as you control their passions and feed their passions. But as soon as somebody develops a passion outside of you, you've lost them. Stalin understood that really well. This is something that, that, that Lucifer, your adversary, understands really well. He's constantly at work undermining any effort that you may exert towards feeding the fashions, passions of the eternal. He knows you better than knew you, you know you. He's been through your trash far more than anybody else has. He knows what you have an appetite for, and he will feed that appetite. He does not have a, 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 a unfettered precedent or unfettered control over you, but he knows what you like. He knows what you've cultivated an appetite for, and he'll make every effort to feed that. That's where we are. That's why we have a group of people here that do not distinguish between a miracle and a meal and say, the guy who fed my belly has got to be the guy who can be my king. And you're following me for the wrong reason. We get across the shore. There's a, there's a uh, Jesus crosses, walks on water. It's, it's just that... And, and I would love to spend more time on that, but we do have to kind of stay focused here. So we're, we're going to move across to the other side of the, uh, the Galilee. It's morning time, and all of a sudden everybody shows up. They, you know, we got lunch yesterday. It's breakfast time. We're ready for breakfast now. And so they show up, and this is where Jesus begins. I tell you the truth. You're looking for me not because you saw the miraculous signs, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. What's the miraculous sign that Jesus is talking about? Yeah, 5,000 people late from five loaves of bread and two little fish. This, this is it. You, you, you missed the miracle because you focused on the meal. You didn't eat a meal. You ate a miracle. It was God that provided that bread. And you testify against yourself. And, and you know, it, later on, Jesus reveals that you testify against yourself when you're thinking manna does it and Moses gave us the manna. But we'll, we'll get down there in a minute. Do not work for food that spoils, but food that endures for eternal life, which the, which the Son of Man will give you. On him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Now, those are the words of Jesus, but that's not new information. If, if, you're, a, if you're a student of the Bible, you should recognize that Jesus introduced very, very little that is actually new. And if you want to go through uh, the scripture with a fine-tooth comb, you may come to the conclusion that Jesus introduced nothing that is new. All he did was reveal what was already on the table in front of you, what you already should have been paying attention to, what you already knew, but you didn't care enough to cultivate an appetite for. So I'm going to take what Jesus just said to him and go back to the book of Isaiah. If you would, go to the book of Isaiah with me, chapter 55. This one's worth kind of just putting a mark on or, or reading for yourself, kind of letting your own eyes fall on these words. Uh, starting at... 55 verse 1 and this remember this is the book of Isaiah this is 600 years before Christ this is the 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 prophet that is referred to as the prophet of the Messiah he this prop the, uh, the prophet Isaiah had more to say about the Messiah than any of the other prophets in terms of quantity starting at verse 1 come all you who are thirsty come to the waters and you who have no money come buy eat come buy wine and milk without money and without cost why spend money on what is not bread, and your labor on what does not satisfy? Now listen to me, and eat what is good, and your soul will delight in the richest fare. Give ear to me, and come to me. Hear me, that your soul may live, and I will make an everlasting covenant with you, and my faithful, um, my faithful love promised to David. 
This is the Lord speaking through Isaiah. He said, come feast. I want you to enjoy the feast that I provide. But money can't buy it. And what I'm offering is the feast of eternity. The feast that feeds your eternal soul. And he uses some language. Milk, wine, bread. And then he makes the, con the, 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 the comparison. Do not work to buy bread that doesn't satisfy. Now, you might struggle with the idea of work there. And Jesus also uses some similar language when he says, um, do not work for food that spoils. Uh, I'm going to suggest to you that we're not talking, no, I'm not going to suggest to you, I'm going to tell you point blank. We're not talking about working for your salvation, working for the grace of God, working for the, the spiritual nourishment that satisfies and that strengthens the eternal soul. We're not talking about working for that. What he's talking about is cultivating an appetite for this. Desire this. Make this the passion of your life. You will find that what you trade for the passions of your life are an easy trade when the passions of your life are the things of God, the things eternal. You won't, uh, um, I, I, in, a, in a conversation I had with some brothers this week, I, I confess that um, I had a, um, an associative relationship with Christ for a lot of my early years of my life. I was raised in the church. I knew church. I was raised in the United Methodist Church. I went to the United Methodist Confirmation class. I made my, my, my statement of commitment uh, or, uh, of, uh, of uh, salvation at the end. I received baptism. So I'm a pledged guard. I'm a full-fledged card-carrying member of the United Methodist Church. Everything was great. I, it's what everybody else was doing. <laughs> there were 13 other kids in this class. We were 12 years old. It was the time you go through confirmation class. That's what you do in this in this denomination. But I I was close to him with my lips, but far from me from him with my heart. But it's my lips that I have to say they weren't that close either. And I know that in my early life I had a rather salty tongue. And I would speak not profanely, not just indiscriminately, but indiscriminately without any conscience at all. It didn't bother me at all to say almost any measure of profanity. But there was a, there was a specific day in my life, which I won't go into right now, where that all that changed. And it was a year after that that I said some, some more salinated, not severe salty word, but more salinated word, and I totally caught myself off guard, and I, I heard myself say that. And I was shocked that I heard myself say that. And that's when I first realized, oh my gosh, it's been a year since I said anything like that. And that really wasn't even that bad. But I haven't said anything like that in at least a year. And that's when I realized God changed my mouth in me without me even recognizing that that's something that needed to change in me. He fixed that in me without me even working on it, without me even thinking about it. That was, that, that was a, a supernatural anchor that I still cling to in my life today about what the power of God can do in a life. And I wasn't even asking for it at the time. It's just that I had started to seek him and his kingdom, and this changed in me, and I wasn't even trying. I had cultivated a new appetite in my life. An appetite for the kingdom of God and the word of God. And it was out of a passion that I had sacrificed a lot of things for. But I didn't sacrifice my mouth. That was cleaned up by God unilaterally. And I changed a great deal. I don't say I changed. A lot was changed in me a great deal in that, in that window of time. And continues to change. Uh, but it's, I, have to, I have to honestly say that I track it back to a change of appetite. I had, I had begun to, to intentionally cultivate an appetite for God's word, God's kingdom, and God's presence in my life. And that changed everything. And it was really easy to let loose of a lot of those old things in my life that I had previously held so close, that I had previously been willing to sacrifice uh, time, money, attention, passion, uh, labor, thought life, integrity. I would have sacrificed any of those things.
to maintain this, this life of the world that once I lived. It was an easy change there, or an easy barter thereafter to, to know, to take back those things, take back my time, take back my resources. My, my big one for me, especially the older I get, my thought life, huge. I mean, it takes a lot to pry me away from my thought life. When things that, that when people in, 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 uh, enter my life who are distracting me in my thought life, it is easy to set them aside. A lot of times it's not set anything outside of things internal. It's other things that would compete for time and attention in my mind that I think about and I cast them out. This is part of that driving thing when I write stuff down, but I'm not writing them down, Marcia, so don't get too freaked out about that. Yeah, that's, that's a big time for me to think. Oddly, shower, big time for me to think. There's times that, that, that nobody else is around, nobody's with me, and that I can use my time and my thought life to focus on what I choose. And my, my appetite is for God's Word. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says that, come to me. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures for eternal life. Y'all came to me for breakfast. When I offer the bread of eternal life, and you haven't cultivated that, you just want to make me king to make sure that every meal is on the table. You don't get, yes, I'm king, but that's not what makes me king. Then they ask him, what must we do to do the works God requires? Now, that's not a horribly unreasonable question. The problem is, is that we, by now, as we read this, we understand that what must we do comes from a, a totally polluted perspective. Just give me the task. Assign me the job. Tell me the rules. Give me the, give me the parameters of the game. What must I do? Just Whatever you tell me to do, I'm going to do. Yeah. All right, this, this eternal life thing, I'm on board. Just tell me what to do. They're looking for the job, the task, the thing to do. It's what the rich Hmong ruler was asking Jesus when he says, what must I do to attain eternal life? Jesus said, gosh, yeah, it, there's, a, there's a do, but it's not the do that you're thinking of. It's not the task that can be assigned you. It's way more than that and much harder than that if you're looking for a box to check on things that I've accomplished in my life. Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe on the one who he has sent. Sounds pretty easy if you're coming from the perspective of what must I do. Oh, believe you? Well, I got a handle on that. Why do you think I came across the lake? Because I believed. That's what, that was my motivation to get in that boat and row all the way across the Sea of Galilee is because I believed. What did you believe? Well, the guy who put lunch on the table is good, should be king. And so I'm coming across here to reinforce that you're king at breakfast time. That's it. No, 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 no. You, you still think that it's, that it's something that you can, you can do. It's something that you become. Becoming. If we, if we, if we go back to, uh, I may get this wrong, but I think it's in Acts. Um, and, I, and, and I will get it wrong, so I'm going to see, I'm going to try to find this really, really quick here. I won't, I won't take long because I'm, I'm going the wrong direction. No, it's in Romans. It's Romans. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting in, in my head. It's Romans. It says, "Be ye renewed." I'm, I'm, I remember this in King James. "Be ye renewed daily by the renewing of your mind." Be ye renewed daily by the renewing of your mind. It's in the in the first couple of chapters of Romans. And, and, and if you if you read that language closely, you realize it's not something you do. It's something that's done to you. But it's something that you submit to. You allow yourself to be renewed daily by the renewing of your mind. You need to see the world the way Christ sees the world. Value what Christ uh, values. Call sacred what Christ calls sacred. Call profane what Christ calls profane. That you had to change the way you think. You want to know what to do? What God requires of you to do? Well, it's believe. But believe is not chase me across the lake for breakfast. Believe is to be renewed daily by the renewing of your mind. To become immersed in God's word. And God's word is not just text on page. Remember, when Jesus is speaking this, text on page is not what's in place. John hadn't written this. John's not writing for another several years. 
when I say several, so between 60 and 80 years from now is when John starts writing this down. That, that, the word of God, yeah, he's going he's gonna to clarify that for you now. It's not like he didn't clarify it for you back in Deuteronomy. You just didn't remember and you didn't, get it, you didn't cultivate an appetite for it. God calls you to hunger such that you would know that man does not live by bread alone, but every word breathed from the mouth of God. I told you this a long time ago. I reinforced it in Isaiah. You still weren't listening. I just demonstrated it on that, on, the, on one side of the Sea of Galilee. You're still not getting it. The closest you can get is you want to make me the king, so I put food on your table. So let me just clarify this for you. Well, gosh, I'm sorry. I, I want to clarify it for you, but you're, you're still digging a deeper hole that you're in. So they said to him, what miraculous sign will you give us that we may see and believe you? So the, the work you're going to do is to believe. Okay, I'm on board. What miraculous sign are you going to give me to believe? Why did you cross the lake? You totally missed the difference between miracle and meal. Has anybody else in your life turned five loaves of bread into food for 5,000 people, you just witnessed a miracle at my hand. And I know that you attributed the miracle to my hand is because you want to make me king because of it. So I know you know this, but you don't understand it. The work you do is to believe. What is to believe? To be renewed daily, to be transformed. It's not a task that you acquire and that, that after you know, a few repetitions you've mastered, like, like archery, which would take more than a few repetitions for me, but some task that you're capable of. That's not what it is. So then, he ta then he, now he starts the clarification. I tell you the truth. It's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it was my Father who gives you the true bread for heaven. For the bread God gives is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. You know, if you're still thinking about lunch, this is totally going over your head. That's why the, the cursory reading of Scripture is so dangerous. Because you'll acquire the words but never understand. You must totally surrender yourself. Cultivate an appetite for what Jesus is offering. There's a good reason why I don't eat raw tomatoes. I do not like raw tomatoes. I haven't got cultivated an appetite for raw tomatoes. I really want an appetite for cucumbers because I think they're really cool and fresh. And, and, but I haven't cultivated an appetite for cucumbers even though I want to cultivate an appetite for cucumbers. Jesus is saying you've never cultivated an appetite for the things eternal, eternal food. It's food for the soul. You've never, so you don't know. You don't understand. You have not cultivated an appetite for it. And I'm here to, I mean, here, that's the whole. Everything that this is about is to help you understand in the same way you understand there's food for the stomach and you get that perfectly, you get his belly grits to grumble and, you, and you, you can think of nothing but eating. I want you to know that you are starving spiritually and that your spiritual stomach is grumbling and you want nothing more than to feed that soul. That's where I want you. It, it's really easy to get to that so-called temptation of Christ and the first so-called temptation at this point and Christ is in the desert and he's on a 40-day fast he's at the end of 40-day fast and remember what a fast is and Lucifer comes and says hey you know you're hungry turn those stones to bread oh my gosh do you totally not get it for 40 days I've just not beating, been feeding the temporal body with temporal soul for, temp or for, uh, for temporal life I have been feasting on that which is eternal. That's what a fast is. You set aside food for the body, so you feast on food for the soul. That's what, exactly what Jesus was doing. So when Lucifer steps in and says, ah, oh, 40 days, you gotta be hungry, turn those, those rocks to bread. Oh, man, you do not get it. You have absolutely nothing to offer me. I'm not, been, I'm not starving, I've been feasting. Just feasting on the eternal. Do you see what Jesus is talking about? He had, this is what you should take away from just that one event is, is that your adversary, Lucifer, has absolutely nothing to offer you. It is only a distraction. 
He knows your appetites. He will feed your appetites. And he will deceive you through feeding your appetites, thinking that a full belly equals king. And when you get to the last of those three temptations, what is Lucifer offering Jesus, which is not his to offer? Well, dominion over the kingdom of men. Now, if you look through Jesus' eyes, Jesus, you know, Lucifer, just as a reminder here, buddy, I created them. I already have dominion over them. Maybe a news flash to you, but I created you too. And I have dominion over you. You have nothing to offer here. And besides, I didn't come to rule them in this world. I came to redeem them out of this world. That's what redemption is, to remove them from the, from the deceit of the fallen world, to purify them, to be my bride, to take them into heaven. And what you want to offer me is to rule them in the cesspool of this world. You've got nothing. You should know that your adversary has nothing to offer you as savory and as sweet as some of what Lucifer will offer you to feed the appetites that you have cultivated in your life. It is only deceit and it is only to your own destruction. Jesus is saying, change your appetite. Cultivate an appetite for eternal life. And the bread of eternal life is me. I am. Every word breathed from the mouth of God. You follow me. You want to, you want to know what the works uh, you know, that God requires you? To believe upon the one whom he sent? That's me. But believing upon me is not lip service to me. Believing uh, upon me is a surrender to me. To take that train wreck of a life that you have and fix it. And then I give it back to you. That's the great thing about salvation. Is, is that you give your life to Jesus. Jesus fix it and he gives it back. You get it back. You just get it back fixed. You no longer have an appetite for those old things that were deceiving, that ultimately ended up as, as it tasted sweet as honey, but in the stomach turned as bitter as gall, if you, if you want to go back to the psalmist language for the exact same point. We got, we got to wrap here. Sir, uh, said from now on, give us this bread. Some would say that that may be a mockery. Some would say that's just, you know, they're, they're poking fun at Jesus. I don't know if it is or it's not. Uh, uh, I don't gather that these people are really getting it at this point, uh, but I'm, I, don't, I don't want to debate or, or, or focus on whether or not it's a mockery. But they said, okay, give us this bread. I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. He who believes me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen and still do not believe. What's he saying? You've seen and still do not believe? I'm right here. You're saying, give me the bread. The bread is here. You're asking, give me a sign, the sign you have. You are so addicted to the drug of, of fallenness that you are completely unable to see the miracle, the presence, the personage of eternity, the author of your soul, when he's standing right in front of you. That's what fallen world looks like to the unredeemed. They don't even have the footprint or the perspective to, to, to hear or to see or to recognize the person of eternity when he's standing right in front of you. And he's offering you the opportunity. And what's the gateway? To believe upon me, to surrender your life to me, to allow me to show you the path home. We have to close. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really not going to get into to the, the rest of this this morning. We have to close. Thoughts before we close this morning? Hey, again, I'm, I'm not meddling, but I'm going to ask you. Spend some time thinking about what are the true appetites in my life? What are distracting? What is food for, for, the, for, for the, 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 just the, the, the mediocrity of a fallen estate of life? And what is food for the eternal? And if somebody went through my trash, would they really find the, 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 the hallmarks of someone who is feasting on the bread of eternal life? And, and again, that's, 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 uh, Christ did that in the lives of these guys because he is who he is. <laughs> he is the omniscient God. It, you're going to have to do that in, inside your own life. Sometimes a brother can look into your life and say, Brad, are you, are you really sure that that's consistent with the faith that you profess? And those are what accountability brothers are good for. But most of this work 
you got to do yourself. You got to look into your own life and ask, what, what have I cultivated an appetite for? What is and what is not productive to eternal life? And what do I need to change about what I'm feeding on? We got to close. Ron, can you close us in prayer this morning? Our most gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we're thankful for this uh, Lord's Day. We're thankful for your word, Lord, that we heard this morning. Uh, Pastor Daniel and then Todd. And Lord, we just pray that uh, this garbage that we have, that, that, uh, that we all have, we just might uh, turn closer to thee, follow you in your will. Uh, we might just praise your name and give thanks. Forgive us when we fail thee. Amen. <laughs>